In this segment, we're going to talk about how to actually build these n-gram language models that we set up previously. So, as I mentioned, we're going to be dealing with mostly a two-gram, or what we're also going to call bigram language models. These terms both mean the same thing. They both predict the next word from one word of context. So, the way that we're going to represent these models is as a conditional probability distribution. So don't worry if you haven't seen probability stuff before, we're gonna walk through what all of these pieces mean. So what I've written here is P for probability, and then parentheses, next word equals Y, given previous word equals X. We're gonna say that vertical line means given. What this means is that the, it, this is a number that is going to represent the probability that the next word is Y, given that the previous word is X. So we can replace x and y with various things, and we're going to need to know what probability that event has. So the probability of the next word equals Austin given previous word equals two. This is something that our model is going to need to keep track of, and that we, then we can ask the model about it. And in this case, I just made up this number, but the number that I made up was 0.2. And what does this mean? This means that if we see two, like we were talking about previously, I think there is a 20% chance. Probability of 0.2 means 20% chance, you know, 0.2 out of one, 20 out of 100, that the next word is Austin. And in general, we're gonna need, like I said, these probabilities for every kind of combination of words that can show up here. So, after previous word equals two, we're gonna have a whole bunch of possible next words, and I wrote down some probabilities for those here. So again, these probabilities aren't really all that reasonable. There's not a 10% chance that the next word is Mexico, but this is just what I wrote down. So this, these, the, the, the important property of these is that these have to add up to one over the vocabulary, over every possible word that Y could be. So we can't just have any word come next. We have a list of words that we've enumerated, and in the hands-on stuff you're gonna be working with, there's about 30,000 of these words. Uh, that's a pretty reasonable vocabulary to have for English, but it's certainly going to ignore things like some names and stuff, there's, there's stuff that's missing there. So critically, again, given previous word equals two, we have a probability distribution over the next words that can follow, and that means that it has to sum up to one. That's one of the rules that probability distributions have to obey. Okay, so with these probabilities, we could build this predictive text system, because what we could do is say, okay, we know that this model gives us probabilities for each possible next word, given that the previous word equals two. And now, we're just gonna get those highest probability words and list them out here. And that's going to be the set of words that the predictive text system shows to you. All right, so the big question here is where we get all these probabilities from, right? I mean, I've just been making them up so far, but what I said was that we were gonna need probabilities for like every single pair of words that shows up, right? That's a lot of numbers. And the idea here, drawing on these machine learning principles, is that we are going to learn them from looking at a lot of text data. We're gonna see what words people write after two, and then that's gonna help us estimate what the, these probabilities are. So this is our basic system that we're working towards building. We're gonna have lots and lots of text data. We're gonna use that to compute these two gram LM probabilities and we're gonna use those to do this predictive text. Okay, so the big step that we need to talk about here is the estimation step. How do we go from this text data to these probabilities? All right, so we need a little bit of a probability crash course here. And I'm, we're gonna talk about estimating probabilities of events. So what I want you to imagine is a scenario where we have a biased coin meaning that it's not like a normal coin where it shows up heads with 50% of the time and tails 50% of the time. Instead, it shows up heads with probability P. So P has to be a number between zero and one. 
Um, and as I said, for a normal coin, this is 0.5, 50-50 chance of heads versus tails. But we don't know what P is. Instead, all we have seen is that we flipped the coin four times. And after flipping it four times, we see heads, 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 tails. So the question I'm gonna ask you is, given only this information about what we've seen, what do you think the probability P of the coin coming up heads is? Again, this is a biased coin. We have some probability of it showing up heads, but it's not necessarily 50%. So I'll pause here for a second. You could pause the video, try to work this out, or take a guess about what you think the answer is. All right. So the again, what I want to stress is that P could be a lot of different things, right? It could be 0.5. If you have a normal coin and you flip it, you might very well see heads, 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 tails. But I think in some ways the intuitive solution here is three out of four probability of being heads, right? Because we saw three heads out of four flips. So it somehow seems right that the probability should be three quarters or 0.75 for heads to come up. And it turns out that there's like a very deep mathematical reason why this is the right answer. We say that this maximizes the probability of the data. And in some ways, that, that means it's the most likely value for P to be given this data. So if you want to get really fancy about it, you can actually compute the probability of the data. The probability of these four trials showing up is P times P times P times 1 minus P, because each of those heads came up with probability P. And then tails has probability 1 minus P, because it's kind of the other outcome here. So if you've taken a calculus course, you can actually take the derivative of this polynomial, set it equal to zero, and then, maxim and, and then basically find where it's maximized. And you'll find that it's p equals 0.75. Don't worry if you haven't seen that before. The main thing to take away from this is we saw three heads out of four trials. So probability heads was three out of four. You just, you just have to count things up and divide by the total number of trials. OK, let's come back to language modeling now. So language modeling is going to look a little bit scarier, but it's the exact same principle. So we're now going to have 33,000 possible outcomes, which are the different words. I mentioned that that's about how many there are in this data you're going to be using. But we're going to do essentially the same thing. So suppose that we are trying to figure out the distribution for words after the previous word equals eat. OK, so one question is basically, how many coin flips are there? What is, how do we even map what we're seeing here onto that notion? Well, we see that eat showed up three times. So we're in this scenario, previous word equals eat, three times. and we're going to look at the next words that come up. And so we see cake shows up once, and pizza shows up twice. So this thing on the left is our data that, we're going to, that we are reading these probabilities off of. OK, so we have three flips. Two of them come up pizza. So that gets probability two out of three. One of them comes up cake, so that gets probability one out of three, and all other words. So there's like 32,998 other words. They all get zero probability. And so again, this is somehow the right answer to this in this deep mathematical way, but it's also just what sort of makes sense if we think about counting up these words. So I'm going to write this in a little bit more formal mathematical notation where we have the probability of a word w, given a word w prev, is the count of w prev comma w. How many times do we see w prev followed by w? And then how many times do we see w prev in general? So these are exactly the things that we computed up above. The w prev here is eat. We see that three times. w prev followed by w. That's the counts of these pairs, like eat pizza. That showed up twice eat cake. That showed up once. OK, so that's basically the story here. 
there's one small complication, one small little bit of complexity we're going to add. And that's that this feels a little bit wrong in that, uh, you know, maybe we only see eat cake and eat pizza, but we all know that there's lots of other things you can eat, right? And it's kind of bad for the model to assign zero probability to say it's totally impossible that, you know, you eat burgers or something like that. So we want to assign a small probability to all other words, just so the model's not kind of ruling anything out. And this is called smoothing. We want to smooth this distribution, not have it be like two thirds, one third, zero, but instead have it be a little bit smoother. So the formula that we're actually going to be using is gonna look like this. This looks a little scary. Let's unpack the different pieces of this. So this w prev w over count of w prev, this is exactly what we had before. And then on the right here, count of w over total word count. This is actually a one gram or a unigram language model. It's just the number of times that word w shows up divided by the total number of words in the data. So in here, for example, pizza would show up twice, so that gets a count of two. And the total number of words in this data is something like 20. All right, and then we have this lambda. Lambda is a number between zero and one that's usually gonna be closer to one, something like 0.9. So what this equation is telling us is it tells us, okay, take the statistics that you get from the two gram model, multiply those by lambda, and add one minus lambda, which in this case is gonna be something like 0.1, times a unigram model probability. And the cool thing is that the unigram model is going to assign non-zero probability to every word because we've seen every word at least once. So it takes these two gram statistics and then you know adds a little bit to the words that maybe got zero from the two gram model. And this is gonna be the formula that we're gonna use going forward. This is a, a, a kind of pretty effective way of making sure that we don't have these zeros in our probability distribution. Okay, so we've now seen all the things that we need to start getting hands-on with the code. So our goal is going to be to read in our text data, to store the counts of these word pairs as well as individual words. So there's gonna be a couple of these diff different counts that we need. And then we're gonna compute these bigram probabilities using this formula, and that's gonna give us our language model. So the next few segments are gonna walk through the code and how you're going to go about actually implementing this. We're gonna give you pieces to do uh, you know, some of these different parts of the process for you so you're not having to write everything yourself. Uh, that's what we're gonna talk through in the next few segments and you're gonna see how to actually build this model over some data that we give you. That's the end of this segment.